probably don't want to die. Most people don't, but death takes us all, no matter our preference. Eventually, inevitably, we will all be nothing but dead. But what if that's not necessarily the case? What if we were somehow able to find a way to avoid death altogether? What would happen? What would Earth be like? Let's talk about it. Most cultures have some version of this mythos, built to teach us that death is a duty, and aging is a means of learning the resolve to face our grave obligation with dignity. We tell ourselves these stories because for most of human history, people didn't expect to live incredibly long. Death was always just around the corner. It made good sense to sugarcoat and proclaim the nobility of passing on to the next world, the next body, or simply blinking into nothing. Though we are unique among Earth's creatures, in that we can anticipate our demise, in all our intellectual superiority, we often can't picture it. Stephen Cave, author of Immortality and executive director of the Leverholm Center of the Future of Intelligence at Cambridge, refers to this as the morality paradox. We all know we're going to die, but we are unable to imagine the form and function of that death, unable to conceive of a world in which we don't exist. Cave suggests a thought experiment. Imagine you're dead. What do you see? Probably your loved ones milling about, right? Hopefully they're saying nice things about you. Maybe you're up in heaven, in line at St. Peter's pearly gates. It's possible you're in the bad place, Ted Danson and all. Whatever you envision, you're still there in the picture and in a similar form as you are now. The very act of imagining summons you like a genie into virtual being, Cave writes. In a dark and empty void, you are still there, the observer, the envisioning eye. But science is now laying siege to the deeply embedded notions that death and aging are immovable realities of life. Science may be winning. Germ theory, sanitation protocols, and modern medicine already adds decades to our lives. Current efforts want to push that limit even further. As the industry has evolved from horse and buggy to steam-powered machines and computer-powered everything, medicine has gone from magic to hard science adding years and then decades to our lives. Forever is no longer unthinkable, which grates against our programming to accept the noble obligation of death. The National Institute for Health has a division dedicated to addressing and treating the unique problems of aging. Silicon Valley is doing everything it can to beat back death, including efforts to marry our bodies to machines and uploads our minds to a mainframe some even believe that we will become energy in our ultimate form, destined to explore the cosmos as matterless clouds. One of these avenues, if not all, is going to find some measure of success. History bears out this belief. We've already doubled our life expectancy without even trying. Over the past 100 years, our medical science has mainly focused on threats that cut us down in our prime. Most of us never had to worry about polio, the Spanish flu, or smallpox. We know now to wash our hands and keep our sewage away from our drinking water. As a result, we're growing grayer. When it comes to immortality, it may not be far-fetched to believe that scientists will be able to create a device that allows humans to prolong their lives for however long they want. Cutting edge technology like this is often prohibitively expensive. Just like the first IBM PC costs about the same as a decent car does nowadays, so too will the latest and greatest in life extension. For the foreseeable future, life extension will be just a wonderfully shiny bauble of luxury far beyond most of our reach. And how could we ethically pursue such an end, dedicating resources and time when those in the developing world, on average, die a full 30 years before those in the West? Don't we have a duty to level the playing field before doing anything to make our own field better? But that's never stopped us before. Technology advances first for those who have the money, then moves forward with the rest. 
As a practical matter, it may be necessary to let some groups surge ahead in order to develop the process in order to bring down the cost so everyone can have it, Davis says. This isn't always a bad thing. At the dawn of the cell phone, many people in Africa still lacked landlines. But by the time the continent had advanced far enough to address that problem, portable phone tech had become so cheap that it allowed Africa to bypass those legacy systems entirely, leapfrog landlines, and go straight to mobiles. The disparity of access is a valid concern, especially when a lack of access means death. But that shouldn't stop us from exploring the potential of what's possible. However, as we probe the edges of our limits, we must remain dedicated to eventually make any discoveries available to all. At the end of the 18th century, English cleric, scholar, and demographer Thomas Malthus postulated that death is the best check against a famine-induced global cataclysmic tragedy. The power of population is so superior to the power of the earth to produce subsistence for man that premature death must in some shape or other visit the human race. He writes in an essay on the principle of population. Malthus was one of the first to observe that there's a proportional relationship between food supply and population. Advances in agricultural technology led to higher crop yields, which leads to healthier babies and higher populations. Malthus feared rapid unchecked population growth would inevitably outstrip a civilization's ability to feed all the people, a fear that is now called a Malthusian crisis. We already failed to clothe, shelter, and power all 7 billion of the world's population. Climate change will only stretch our ability to do the same for the next billion people we're projected to add over the next 20 years. If war, poverty, and our inclination towards the dangers of vice fail to eliminate enough of our numbers, a gigantic inevitable famine stalks in the rear, and with one mighty blow, levels the population with the food of the world, Malthus says. In other words, unless enough of us bow out early on account of stupidity, violence, or health, Homo sapiens are screwed. Of all the arguments against life extension, the Malthusian catastrophe is the one that worries Davis the most. Rather than think about the problem in the abstract, he teamed up with a demographer to find out what would happen to the world if we were to live to be 150 or even 1,000 years old. What they found was that sustainable life extension may come with some pretty tough decisions. In the first set of numbers they ran, everyone in his hypothetical population of a billion people is on some form life extension therapy that allows them to live 150. In the second set, the life extension tech is way better and everyone lives to a thousand. In the first scenario, if every woman were to have two children, one when the woman is 25 and the other when she reaches 75, the population would triple in just over 100 years, and we'd reach 21 billion sometime by the end of this century. That's a full 10 billion more than current projections. So even a fairly modest increase in life expectancy, less than a doubling, will produce a Malthusian crisis, Davis says. But if we tighten our belts a little, say one child per every two women, things start to level out at a one-third increase after a couple of decades, then starts to decline. The same happens in the second scenario after 850 years. His model shows that the world could survive if we live longer, but we'd have to make other concessions. He concedes that his plan isn't exactly perfect or moral. But Davis proposes that only those who opt in to life extension would need to be restricted. It's a poor choice between our lives and the lives of our prospective children, but it's an inevitable one if our medium ages continue to rise. We should prepare ourselves to make this decision, or at least prepare our children to ponder. In the end, it's hard to predict what we may do and how we may change when the nature of how we think about our time on Earth is fundamentally altered by our supply of it. But that doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't try to obtain those gains. Rather, it reaffirms a need to proceed with caution, to move forward with eyes wide open. But, beyond all the arguments of extending our lives on Earth, one day our planet will die too. All other things equal or ignored, the only way we will survive is if we explore the vast distances of space and colonize other worlds. And for that, 
we will need to find a way to live long enough as individuals or as a species to survive centuries-long trips to other galaxies. That fact presents maybe the best case for life extension, that in order to fulfill our desires to see the stars and become an intergalactic species, we ourselves must live on a galactic scale.